Today, I'm taking you to church. Not literally, of course, but rather I'm going to walk you through a church service based on my experience over the first 21 years of my life, where I consistently attended church three times per week. As the service progresses, we'll discuss the techniques churches often use to emotionally influence their attendees for the sake of converting people, convincing the audience of the speaker's message, retaining members, and motivating people to base their entire lives on Christianity. First, though, I'd like to make two clarifications. One, the service I'll describe is based on my experience in Protestant churches in the U.S. There's a great deal of diversity across Christian denominations, so if what I describe doesn't mirror your church experience, that's probably why. Still, you may find some parallels between what I'll describe and your own experience in different churches, so I encourage you to keep watching. Two, I don't mean to imply that those coordinating church services have any malicious intent. I think the vast majority of those involved in these services mean well and care about their congregation. However, the practices I'll discuss have just become so normalized that most Christians at any level of leadership don't thoroughly consider the ethics of these practices. With that said, let's go to church. Beginning with an emotionally charged ritual. You walk into the room where the service is held. Most likely, there's music playing softly. You greet some friends and acquaintances, find your seat, and after a few minutes, the music comes to a stop. Everyone quiets down, knowing the service is about to start. After a short greeting, prayer, or announcement, the worship leader invites everyone to join them in singing. The first song is simple and familiar so that everyone can follow along. You may feel a bit self-conscious about singing at first, but near the end of the first song or two, Everyone is singing, and the energy in the room swells. People surrounding you are singing confidently, so you feel comfortable raising your voice a bit more too. Now the worship leader changes it up a bit. The music continues as they pray into the microphone. There's conviction and awe in their voice as they thank God for his blessings and ask him to reveal himself in this service. An amen punctuates their prayer, and the lyrics of the next song begin. They're different this time, more vulnerable. The people surrounding you match the song's emotional, introspective tone, and some raise their hands to God in love and praise. Forget any shyness or tiredness you may have brought into the service. You're feeling God's presence now. Your reservations, your stubbornness melts away, and you open your heart to what God has to show you. Soon, worship concludes, and you're ready to listen to the sermon. The worship-first format most Protestant churches follow is designed with a purpose. Communal worship sets the tone and gets people ready to listen to the speaker. It's basic social psychology. Acting in unity with a crowd, especially in repetitive actions, lessens your sense of self and allows you to act as one with others without much effort. Instinctively, conforming becomes what's most comfortable. Additionally, music, especially in social settings, takes you out of your head and ushers you into a shared emotional experience, one which makes you more receptive to feelings and ideas spoken to the crowd. Repetitive ritual, especially when music is involved, creates an emotionally charged, receptive, even impressionable crowd. Church and music leaders of all kinds know this well. Our entire goal is to make people feel like they're connecting with God, to trigger that big emotional response and spiritual high. And we know exactly what works. We're professionals. Music is a language of emotions. It makes listeners feel a certain way. Our ears and minds connect sound to certain feelings, memories, subconscious thoughts. Believe it or not, music actually does this way more effectively than visuals do. You see where I'm going with this. We know exactly how to use music to change people's emotions. Worship music is all about the dynamics, the build-up, that hopeful soaring climax that can send shivers down your spine or make you feel in tune with some grand act of God. The songs are written with this moment in mind and a good band or MD can make the experience that much more engaging. If church leaders want a congregation that's ready to listen and comply with what the speaker says, it's best to hold worship first to put them in that state of mind. That's why most churches do it that way. Eliciting specific emotions through music. Let's revisit the worship portion of the service from earlier. The congregation has joined together in song. Hands are being raised. Praise lyrics radiate from every direction. The worship leader prayerfully introduces the next song, one all about sacrifice, giving your all for God's sake. It starts softly, with minor chords playing behind the leader's voice, accentuating the mournful lyrics. Those around you join in slowly, and soon, you do too. 
I give my all to you, you sing, no turning back. The worship leader bellows out, do you give your all to him, church, as the music soars into the next chorus. You can't help but sing a bit louder as both excitement and conviction overcomes you. However you entered into the service, you know that now you'll only leave it more prepared to put God first in your life. Later, the sermon begins. The topic turns out to be the importance of making personal sacrifices and following God's will. As the speaker discusses things they've had to leave behind in order to follow God, whether it be a kind of music, a particular habit, a friend, or even a partner, you begin to think of things in your life that God might not condone. You may not have thought those things were much of a problem before, but you've already poured your heart out to God today, telling him that you'll put his will above all else. Now you're feeling convicted. You'd be a hypocrite to sing those words in front of God and everybody, yet refuse to follow the guidance of the sermon. You listen with the intent of making change. The sermon concludes and a prayer begins. The song about sacrifice which you sang earlier plays in the background. Those minor chords in the intro remind you of the distance which your worldly habit or relationship has created between you and God's will for your life. You're ready to give that up, and following the speaker's advice, you ask God for the strength to do so once you leave the service and rejoin the rest of the world. Repetitive ritual and communal worship can not only put you in a listening mood, but the music specifically chosen to complement the sermon can emotionally prime you to receive and conform to the speaker's message. This can help the speaker get through to more people, especially when the message is one which instructs listeners to change their behavior in an uncomfortable or even painful way. Again, church leaders know that music can create an emotionally charged environment which boosts the audience receptiveness, and further, they know that specific kinds of music can create specific emotional states in the audience. We know the exact emotional journey that a crowd is about to go on. We plan it all out. These big moments make people feel connected to God through lyrics and sounds. They're a huge part of my relationship with God. And you'd be surprised just how much the band feeds off the energy of a crowd just as much as they feed off of us sometimes. People responding to music in unison, praising God together, was so uniquely validating to what I was doing. Those spontaneous moments of spiritual high that were actually carefully calculated and rehearsed made God feel real, present, personal, powerful. But as an MD especially, they were never truly out of my direct control. Yet again, I had to be brutally honest with myself about how God worked. Now whenever I look out into a crowd during these times, one thing is clear. He isn't the one doing this. I am. This understanding of music's power to create specific emotional states plays a major role in church leaders' efforts to influence their congregation. When making a purely rational case is difficult for any number of reasons, leaders often rely on using emotion to convince others of that case instead. Playing on emotional vulnerabilities. Let's pick our church service back up in the post-sermon prayer. The familiar song about sacrifice continues to play as the speaker revisits the topic of the sermon. They urge the congregation to meet with God in prayer right now. Give your struggles over to Jesus. You might say, Pastor, I've held on to this sin, this habit, this friend, this sexual relationship so long that I can't let it go on my own. But Jesus' strength is enough. You say you can't do it on your own, and that's true, but you won't do it on your own. Jesus' strength is enough. There's someone in this very room who knows it's time to give up that sinful relationship. There's someone who's battling depression. There's someone who's gone through hardship and loss. There's someone here in this room right now who's so ridden with guilt that they've given up having the right relationship with Christ. Let me tell you, friend, if that's you, Jesus' strength is enough. There are people standing at the front right now who are ready to pray with you. Come forward and give it all to Jesus. Keeping your head bowed, you hear a few people leave their seats and walk to the front. He mentioned the sin I'm struggling with, you think. Should I walk to the front too? Your feeling of conviction, which began during worship, now reaches its peak. Praying from where you stand, you prostrate yourself before God, begging Jesus to forgive you and to lend you his strength so that you can live in accordance to his will. The music begins to soften and finally comes to a stop. As you come out of prayer, feeling closer to God than you did at the start of the service, the speaker says a few parting words and dismisses the service. 
When you're emotionally vulnerable, when you feel guilt, shame, anxiety, sadness, or just insecurity surrounding a behavior or personal struggle of yours, hearing that behavior or struggle named in front of a crowd can feel deeply personal, like the speaker is addressing you specifically. Depending on the exact context, it can even feel like God himself must be leading the speaker to address you personally. The highly emotive ritual and music throughout the service emotionally prime you to enter a vulnerable, impressionable state. So if you didn't enter into the service feeling particularly vulnerable, those things are often enough to make you feel that way by the end. Even if the speaker mentions several other sins and struggles from the stage which you can't relate to, you'll still take notice when they mention something to which you can relate. Especially in an emotionally heightened state, it's easy to remember the hits, forget the misses, and remember the experience as directed toward you more than it really was. When all of these elements, the repetition, the carefully selected emotionally charged music, the prayer directed at the emotionally vulnerable, all come together within a service, they don't just serve to facilitate spiritual experiences, but rather to simulate them. If you've ever experienced a service like the one I described and you felt something which you describe as spiritual, ask yourself, if there was no worship leader to hype up and direct the crowd, if there was no emotive music, if there was no emotionally charged altar call where the speaker lists out people's emotional vulnerabilities, would I have had that spiritual experience? Was it really God and I coming together? Or did the church just successfully create an illusion? Setting a moral obligation to participate. So, the service is over. A couple days go by and you think back on your experience at church. Since a little time has passed, you've come to feel less strongly about the big spiritual commitment you made during the service. Did I get a bit too caught up in the moment, you wonder? You think about skipping church this week to try to figure it out on your own, but then you remember something that you've learned in church about that. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage and warn each other, especially now that the day of his coming back again is drawing near. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. As you've learned in church and have probably read in the Bible yourself, attending church regularly is a necessary part of Christian practice. Even if you think it's best to stay home and clear your head, well, sorry, but you have a moral obligation to keep attending. You could look for another church, sure, but it's unlikely you'll find one that doesn't use a similar formula for simulating spiritual experiences unless you explore markedly different denominations. Plus, people might start asking questions or even judging you if you begin making changes. So, you decide, it's probably best that I go again this week. You walk into church the following Sunday, the music begins to play, and the cycle repeats. This moral mandate to keep attending church is enough to keep many people coming back even if they have valid reasons to stop. The emotional priming I've described here may not work the first time or even the first few times that a person attends, but when a perceived moral obligation puts you there every week, when you start to recognize the songs, when you grow accustomed to the speaker's presentation style, when everyone around you becomes familiar, when repetitive, emotionally charged rituals become the norm, it pulls you in. When this formula for spiritual experience becomes comfortable and anticipated, your guard wears away. It becomes easy to believe that God really is there in that worship service or sermon or prayer. After all, those around you consider that interpretation of their emotional experience to be correct. Why consider that view as anything but normal? Again, while I don't think it's done maliciously, church services like these are designed to manipulate your emotions so that you conform to the church's wishes. Church leaders often genuinely want their congregation to experience God's presence, so they create an environment where specific emotions run high, effectively simulating God's presence. They want you to learn from their sermons, so they prime you with music, placing you in an impressionable state. They want you to give your life to God completely, so they create and target emotional vulnerabilities, knowing that conversion and rededication are often motivated by a sense of one's personal brokenness. If experiences of God's presence are real, 
They shouldn't require emotive ritual and music to occur. If the gospel is intellectually convincing, people shouldn't need to be emotionally primed before hearing it. Of course, Christians do report spiritual experiences and conversions happening outside of church, but isn't it telling that most experiences of God's presence and most conversions seem to occur in these emotionally charged environments? It's enough to make one wonder, who is really responsible for the experiences of churchgoers? God or the church? Thanks for watching. I've been Drew of Genetically Modified Skeptic. A special thanks to my patrons for their constant love and support. If you want to hear more from me, subscribe and follow me on social media at the handles below. As always, if you're an apostate in need, there are resources linked in the description to help you find community and mental health support. Remember to be kind to others in the comments, and until next time, stay skeptical.